thank you very much. Uh, this is a very uh, difficult time to give uh, predictions, forecasts, uh, or even interpretations. Uh, if I had uh, given a forecast before October 7th, it, it's going to be very different from after October 7th, and there's a lot of uncertainty. So later on, as I go through the talk, I'll, I'll try to um, uh, clarify how uh, the events of the Hamas uh, um, Israeli situation uh, may uh, affect uh, where we're going. So there are three topics I'm, I'm going to cover. Um, the first thing I, that I was asked is, you know, have we learned the lessons of uh, the great financial crisis uh, 14 years ago? Uh, where are we 14 years? Uh, afterwards. Uh, um, I'm going to look at it from a very uh, international perspective, particularly an American perspective. And then uh, the second topic, I'm going to look uh, more narrowly uh, on Greece. And then finally, I'm going to give a, a, a very uh, global picture of where uh, the world is going, uh, both from the perspective of before October 7th and after October 7th. So uh, first, uh, on um, have we uh, absorbed uh, the lessons of 2008, the Euro crisis, um, which was the most traumatic f economic crisis in 75 years? And I guess I'd say uh, a little bit. Uh, we, th there have been changes, uh, but not enough. And some of the things that, that have happened uh, in the last year or two uh, uh, bolster my, my perspective that we haven't uh, done enough. Um, the um, one way of looking, you know, every moment in history is related to previous moments. And so uh, there is a sort of a, a web that goes throughout, so you can't divide would happen, but it's hard to remember that in the years before the 2008 financial crisis, uh, there was discussion of what was called the great moderation. The great moderation was the claim under Greenspan, uh, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, that we had solved the problem of the business cycle. It was over. And there were economists like Bob Lucas at the University of Chicago, who famously said uh, in a speech <laughs> four years before the financial crisis, we have, as an economics profession, solved the problem of uh, crises and that we know how to avoid them. That's history. Well, it wasn't history. And uh, the from my perspective, the interesting thing was that we were at that very moment sowing the seeds of what came to be the 2008 financial crisis through financial sector deregulation and liberalization. And uh, we allowed uh, the banks basically to take uh, enormous risks. The background for that goes back further in history because we had the Great Depression. And after the Great Depression, we imposed very strong financial regulations. And we had more than 50 years of almost no crises anywhere in the world. But then we thought because uh, we hadn't had any crises, we didn't need financial regulations. And so they took them away. And lo and behold, uh, you started having uh, crisis after crisis, more than uh, 100 around the world. Well, uh, afterwards, we passed in the United States the Dodd-Frank bill, uh, and then began a process of undoing this. Uh, I remember being at uh, a dinner uh, right before uh, Trump came in, off came in office, and one of his chief advisors was saying uh, they were going to uh, strip away the regulations. And I said, uh, you know, don't you remember that we had a financial crisis? Uh, 
just a few years earlier, and that was already ancient history. So under the current chairman, Jerome Powell, they took away the re oh, many of the regulations, and um, what we saw once again is the problem that we had before, short-termism and bad risk management led us to some more financial crises, uh, not financial crises, but uh, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank went bankrupt. These were big bankruptcies, costing American taxpayers in tens of billions of dollars. So the, it's not a small, these weren't small events. They didn't, uh, because we had, had imposed stronger capital requirements, they didn't lead to a systemic crisis so that's the glass half full. We had done something, but we clearly hadn't uh, uh, addressed the fundamental problem. And uh, Silicon Valley Bank is not a minor bank for the US and global economy. Half of all the startups, all those tech companies that have made been so important for the US economy and the global economy had uh, banked at Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, so it was, it was a big thing. Um, let me go on fairly uh, quickly uh, to the other topics because I see my time is running out. And I, um, let me come down to Greece. Um, before I came here, I, I spent uh, a couple of days in, in Athens and you could feel the the energy, the, the, the you know, the, uh, it, 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 uh, it was a great recovery from uh, those of us who went here in the days of the Euro crisis. Um, on the other hand, when you look at the statistics, uh, they're not great. Uh, Greece is still below the level that it was before the, Euro, uh, before the Greek crisis, the Euro crisis. Uh, you know, in Latin America, we talked about the last decade. You're talking about the decade and a half. Now, to be fair, you have the uh, COVID-19 uh, in, in between, but still a decade and a half of no growth is something that, to be worried about. Um, looking at it as an outsider, uh, you know, the natural question is uh, how well is... Greece poised going forward. It's had strong growth this year, among the strongest in Europe, but what about the longer run? And uh, let, me, let me just mention uh, five concerns I have. May, uh, hopefully you, you'll discuss these, not only in this session, but later. Um, one of them is um, the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit uh, does a review every year of democracy. And while overall uh, things aren't so bad, there's one area that is a particular concern to me, which is free press. And uh, uh, you can't have a vibrant democracy without a vibrant media. And uh, your score in that is is is. Uh, of worry. The second thing is that um, you have a, Greece hasn't had the structural transformation that is needed. Uh, your growth is disproportionately in tourism. Tourism is a vulnerable industry. Uh, it's vulnerable uh, for a whole variety of reasons. One of them is you live in a very dangerous part of the world. Uh, there, and, and tourists are sensitive. A second reason is that um, uh, uh, climate change, uh, getting warmer in the summer, fire, wildfires, uh, those are things that affect tourism. So economists, I mean, we go around telling every country they need to diversify, uh, but uh, I think the argument for uh, Greece is particularly uh, strong. And uh, two aspects of that diversification. One is uh, climate, 
energy. Uh, you have a strong endowment of sunlight and wind. And the question is, have you fully utilized that? Um, and uh, the weather is variable, but I think dictators like Putin and MBS in Saudi Arabia are more uncertain. And so I would be, I'd rather be reliant on, on nature than I would on Putin and MBS. Um, fourthly, uh, mentioned in the first session today was uh, technology. Uh, we live in a technological world and uh, keeping up in technology is a race for everybody. And I think, uh, you know, we're worrying about what it will do to our society. I think it's something that every country needs to uh, 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 think about. And finally, let me mention uh, a macro problem that is going to be facing uh, Greece for a long time is the repayment of the debt is going to require primary surpluses and maintaining a strong macro economy in the face of those primary surpluses is, is not going to be easy. Let me, in the remaining couple of minutes, um, talk about um, global issues. Um, I'll begin with the United States. Uh, the big problem as we emerged from uh, the pandemic was inflation, uh, the highest inflation we'd had for a long time. And there was a big debate in the United States of what was the cause. And there were two schools of thought. Uh, was it excess demand caused by overzealous spending by the Biden administration particularly in trying to protect us from the COVID-19? Or was it supply side interruptions and demand shifts associated with the pandemic and then the war in Ukraine? I thought the evidence was unambiguous. It was mostly supply side problems. And aggregate demand was actually lower than uh, projected before the, the uh, 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 COVID came out pandemic. Um, the Federal Reserve misdiagnosed the problem. It thought it was an aggregate demand, raised interest rates, you don't get more oil, you don't get more chips for cars. That was one of the main sources of inflation in the beginning. Uh, you don't get more housing by raising interest rates. You actually get less housing, and therefore uh, housing costs go up. So I thought they had the wrong recipe. And uh, the, the good news is that the supply side uh, things got reversed, are disinflationary. Inflation has come way down below 3% and is clearly stable. Um, what is, I, I'm, I, I'm hopeful and was hopeful before at least uh, October 7th that uh, we would have a soft landing. That, but their soft landing was a combination of two big mistakes. One, the Fed raised interest rates too much, but at the same time, we had a very strong fiscal policy, stronger than anybody intended. And this is uh, really uh, important in the global perspective. U.S. finally adopted uh, industrial policy for climate change. We thought it was uh, a bill of around 300 and some billion dollars, but it was an open-ended tax credit that looks like now over, well over $1 trillion. Some people estimate $1.5 trillion. So that is going to counter the contractionary. One, uh, so there are two, two uh, risks here. One is the Republican Party is in disarray and we don't have a functioning government and we'll probably have a, a, a government shutdown. And the second one is what happens uh, in uh, Israel. And um, I'll, let me come to that in just a minute. 
Uh, first, I'll talk just a minute about where Europe is. Uh, Europe is obviously in a slowdown. It doesn't have a number of the advantages that the U.S. has. It doesn't have the advantage of cheap energy. It doesn't have the advantage of a very expansive fiscal policy. But the ECB, to keep up with the U.S., and worried about inflation, and with the same mis misdiagnosis, has raised interest rates. And that's going to dampen uh, the European uh, economy. The final thing about the European economy is it's very dependent on China. China, remember, was what got us out of the 2008 crisis. It, it, it accounted for a very large part of the global growth after 2008, and after the euro crisis. It's not there now. Growth is down 4 or 5 percent. Some people think it's even lower than that. Uh, China has a whole set of economic problems I can't go into right now. but. European dependence on China, particularly Germany, is a problem. Um, now, uh, I don't have time to talk about the tension between the U.S. and China and the, and the where you're uh, fixed into that. Let me just uh, final, uh, uh, conclude in what my view of the, the worry is. The worry is that the conflagration in the Middle East will, because of, partly because of the Arab street, force Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, uh, all to do what happened in the 1970s, which is reduce the supply of oil. It's the one weapon they have, the economic weapon. And it's an interesting economic weapon because as they reduce their supply of oil, the price of oil goes up and they're actually better off because the, the demand elasticity is very low. So the, it, it's a way that, that they collude together in effect, raising the price, but that spike in price is going to reignite inflation and that reigniting inflation may have very big implications for politics in both Europe and in the United States. The election in the United States, the polls show, is going to be close. This could be something that could tip the balance. And uh, it's very likely that Trump will win the primaries. If it tips the balance and he wins in the final election, it will have very big repercussions for the world. Uh, uh, with weakening of support in the war against Ukraine, uh, weakening of the rule of international rule of law, a uh, whole set of consequences that are almost unfathomable.